The next part, uh, like I said, is analyzing media. Um, so we'll go through a couple different options, uh, manual, uh, SAM, which I will explain that term and what it means and why it's important to us and has its own uh, acronym within our uh, hierarchy here. Uh, and then AI or algorithmically assisted uh, annotation. All right. So um, just to kind of orient everyone to what it's like to be in the player, when you launch into a video player, um, you'll get this scene right here. Um, the important parts are essentially the video controls are over here on the bottom. Uh, the observations panel, which will have information about the analysis that you're doing, is over here on the right. Uh, and then the actual annotation tools will be over here on the left. right? And then on the top will be markings that you use for QAQC, which I'll discuss in a bit. When you're ready to actually go and annotate a video, you have a couple of different options. Select is basically just your way of basically clicking on things if boxes exist in the scene, and then you'll see their information on the right. Um, you can draw a box around an observation. Um, you can use the segment anything model. So this is one click assisted annotation, um, or you can kind of zoom in to get kind of finer grained access to that, All right? So we'll, we'll, we'll do an example of that uh, here. So we'll launch into this video. Um, you again see all of the kind of controls here. Um, you'll notice that you have the ability to specify what resolution you'd like the video to play at. Um, this is uh, in recognition of the fact that not everybody um, has really high bandwidth uh, internet. And so the ability for you to essentially play the video at a much lower resolution, in this case, 360p, uh, and then pause and get kind of a high resolution um, uh, still is kind of important. Kind of tough. You can't really see it uh, in, in here, but I do assure you that there was lower resolution when, when you do that. So when you're ready, um, you can create a box, right? And when you do that, you can enter a common or scientific name. I have no idea what this thing is, but I'm pretty sure it's some kind of crab, um, which at the highest level is probably that. Uh, and when I'm done, I'll hit escape. And then by clicking on it, I can see some details about it, right? Um, in this case, it chose crab spiders as an alternate name or a common name, which this is probably not. Uh, so if I wanted to go through and change this to something else, I could edit its label or taxonomy. So I could, I could clear it here. Uh, and I could do something else. I have no, like I said, I have no idea. I'm not a marine biologist, but if I if I knew it was like a certain type of fish, for instance, then I could choose uh, Sebastian's, for instance, uh, and then it would allow me to save those changes. Uh, and now it's properly been updated here. Pretty straightforward um, so far. You can then kind of get a preview of maybe without watching the whole video where you might want to annotate next. So if I go here, uh, then I can say, oh, okay, I want to I wanna look at this squid-ish type thing. And I'll go, let's say squid. The highest level, cephalopoda. Uh, and if I wanted to keep drawing more of these things, I could. But for now, I just want to have that one. It's, it's there. Um, some alternate names. And again, uh, these alternate names come from the worms lookup. So these lookups um, can be in any number of languages. Uh, so um, some of them can be a little uh, hard for me to pronounce. Uh, I have no idea what language that even is. Possibly Russian? I don't know. Um, when you want to go and start doing AI-assisted annotation, right? So... Um, what we have access to is the single click annotation and the, the acronym SAM stands for segment anything model. Uh, and what that does is essentially allows us to try and find a bounding box um, around an object of interest just by providing a single click, right? So if I go here, this can often save me, you know, a fair bit number of steps associated with actually bounding box, drawing bounding boxes of things in the image. Um, I can zoom in to maybe try and get more of these things. Again, I don't know what these are. They look like maybe some sort of 
shrimp type things. Um, but once I've done that, I can go through and all of these now show up as observations within, within here. And I can show them in order within the video. If I want to quickly sort between them, um, I can go here. So I want to unzoom here, which I can do uh, by a control mouse wheeling. So you can zoom either by drawing a region or you can control zoom uh, like, like you're zooming in with your mouse wheel here. Uh, but what you can do is quickly go between all of your uh, observations by clicking on them here. Um, another view of that is actually our observation timeline. So here you can actually see all of your observations in a video in chronological order uh, and see where they are. Um, and we'll, this will become more interesting when we talk about the AI assisted annotation. Uh, but this is a good way for you to, you know, get rapid uh, both annotations as well as review or kind of situational awareness about what are in your videos. So um, if we go back, um, another option for us would be to go through and analyze this video via algorithm, right? Uh, and currently within the portal, we have two algorithms that we can choose from. The FathomNet Megalodon detector, uh, which is trained uh, by researchers at Ambari um, that detects objects of interest only. So what this will do is it will draw boxes like the one uh, that you saw there, um, and it will just assign them a label of object. So it's not trying to do classification, um, recognizing that um, taxonomies or classes or, you know, fine grained classification across different parts of the world um, can be very tricky and we don't have all of that data. Uh, but object detection tends to be a little more uh, generic. Uh, another algorithm that we have is the FathomNet Vulnerable Marine Ecosystems Detector. Uh, and this is an object detection mo model to fine tuned to detect basically four high level classes of benthic animals from deep sea imagery. Uh, and so what that what those will do is essentially output labels that don't map to the worms taxonomy, but provide uh, corals, crinoids, sponges, and fishes. Right, um, Connie. I don't know if you want to talk at all about why this is a good model uh, or not. Um, this is actually came from the community. I think um, uh, like a paper a year ago about you know, how might you visually detect um, or classify vulnerable, vulnerable marine ecosystems from visual data and noting these four or really three animal groups, but uh, the crinoids, the corals and the sponges as, as members uh, that represent that. <clears throat> yeah. So when you're ready to then go ahead and run that, you can choose to analyze this video with this algorithm. Um, this algorithm can take a while to run. It has to basically spin up a GPU container, run those, run that, uh, and then upload the results to the platform. Uh, and so what will happen is you'll get outputs of these results when it finishes. Uh, so I will go back here. And this is that, that kind of cooking show version of that is we actually went through and ran these algorithms on um, some of these videos already. Uh, and then so here... When you go to the observation timeline, you notice that it's not just those X marks, right? So these algorithms have actually generated tracks associated with them. Uh, so similarly to here, um, you can you can see these two things. And so now we get into why it's important to be able to do interesting things with tracks is because in this case, um, it's actually tracking the same thing. Uh, but it has a little bit of a gap between them and it doesn't know it's the same model. So what you can do is you can actually highlight them and you can tell them that they're actually the same track. And what that does is it it makes it back into a single observation uh, for, for that. Uh, similarly here, um, this is not the same thing again, so I wouldn't go and do that, but I can quickly move through and find objects that might be the same uh, and stitch them together. Usually you can kind of get a good idea of which ones might be the same by seeing how closely positioned they are uh, within this timeline. Uh, but you can also just kind of go through them here uh, and do that merging manually. Another thing that you can do, um, you can go the other way, right? So if we 
we actually decide that, nope, they're not the same thing. We can take this track and we can split it, right? And where it will split is essentially right where this line is, right? And then it will split that there and we'll be back to two separate observations. So this can be good for, say, when uh, a track starts tracking one thing and then makes an error and starts tracking another thing. You can split those tracks into separate observations. Um, once you're ready to then review all of those observations, you can start looking at them within a single space called our observation gallery. What this will do uh, is whether they are single, uh, single localizations or multiple localizations, so tracks, um, they'll all show up and they'll show you the first uh, localization associated with them. Um, they'll also show you a little bit of information. So in this case, this was an algorithm created observation. Uh, it has 687 localizations associated with it, and it exists from frame zero to 686. Um, you may go through and say, okay, yeah, that looks good. That looks good. And let's pretend you had actually uh, labeled these. And then you can, you can essentially verify those classifications. So these then become verified within, uh, within the um, uh, QA, QC workflow, right? And so if I go in, and I want to look at observations within the entire platform. I can then say, okay, uh, observations within the entire platform. I'm I'm a uh, reviewer. I would like to just see only ones that have been verified. I add that filter, and I see that these then pop up. Right, these have then become verified, uh, and this can be useful for exporting data. Right, so later I'll show you how you can export only verified uh, observations. Uh, you could change the classification or unverify them. Um, but now we're going to start getting into a little bit of the actual. Um, uh, stay with me. Bear with me. Uh, export and organization stuff. So I'm going to stop there as well and open it up to questions around the actual annotation and analysis stuff. Um, we had one question in the chat, uh, Ben, about does the label tool automatically fill in the taxonomy of species? For example, if I type bluefin tuna, do I get the whole taxonomy? Yes. Yeah, and just to, answer, yes. Um, yeah, and, and just to expand on that, we're we're spending uh, we spent a bunch of time workshopping how common names and um, uh, will map to uh, map to the taxa, um, and uh, we're still sort of enhancing that. So I think we're going to get a lot of really good feedback on kind of how that works. So you can apply it as Ben is um, uh, Ben is showing here. But we know that um, we may have we're sort of planning for future use cases where we may have um, less expert taxonomists participating, as as Kakani mentioned. Um, and so we know that using um, common names for certain, uh, you know, trigger certain uh, taxa will will be a use case. So we're continuing to refine that, but it should work. And so right now, yeah, you can see them as, you know, bluefin tuna here within the alternate names, but the preferred kind of, uh, you know, way of really interacting with these is by the, by the taxonomy, because that's going to be how most people are going to be using these for reporting purposes or exporting purposes to things like the FathomNet database or for their own analysis, right? So you can search for observations using things like Bluefin Tuna, just like I did there to um, to, to change the label. Um, but you can also just search on any of these things as well. Any other questions? Yeah, I just want to add, you know, this this functionality really is enable, enabled by the hard work of the Worms editors. Um, we're just pulling that information from, you know, from their API. Yeah, I should. Yeah, I, it's a good point. So the taxonomy search that we do is based on a hosted uh, snapshot of the Worms API, as well as some additional categories from the Embari Deep Sea Guide, which allow us to do things like those objects or detritus or various kind of like non-biotic uh, things. So um, it allows us to do that. And it, that's what allows us to quickly do this full um, kind of taxonomic ancestor as well as all the way down stuff. Um, we recognize that the Worms API is not static by any means. Um, so there is a risk that 
you know, if your observations have updated in the meantime of using this, that they may become out of date, we will be updating it periodically. Um, it's still TBD how we're going to handle basically going through and updating observations that exist within the platform that may have changed. Uh, just because some people may not want to go through and have found out that their data has just suddenly changed on them, right? So it's it's one of those things where we're really going to be working with a lot of the early adopters to kind of smooth out these kind of user preference types of things moving forward. Great. And Filippo, uh, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, if you want to unmute and ask your next question before we get to the others in the chat. Yes, um, thank you so much for the answer. And it looks like a great tool. I have just a quick question about frame by frame classification of videos. Um, I saw you basically just playing the video and then stopping and manually classifying um, the image. But in case we want to manually classify, I don't know, uh, one frame every 10, is there any um, possibility to set a FPS and then classify accordingly? Uh, not within the portal. Um, if you need kind of a very, I'm going to call that, even though it makes sense, that's a pretty logical thing to do. I'm going to call it like kind of like a bespoke uh, way of doing that classification. Then you may want to currently look at some other tools, sampling protocols within a QA, QC workflow and setting up projects to kind of like auto mark those either for export is something we do now for training purposes. Uh, and it is on the roadmap for us to do in the future where you may set up a project and upload a video and then set a sampling rate for reviewer one of once every five seconds. Uh, and then what will happen is that will show up in their queue for, for doing that kind of stuff. But that's kind of um, on the future roadmap for the coming year, uh, kind of a post-launch thing. We're really kind of focused on that manual and algorithm assisted annotation of delivering that solid experience now and then expanding those capabilities kind of uh, as we as we progress thank you yep. um we have a question about is it possible to batch remove ai generated localizations batch remove um well you could go to observations uh let's see this is not a good one because it only has that one but if we go to one of the ones where I ran the algorithm uh, and we go to observations, you can go to filters, you go to observation, and you could say creation equals algorithm create. Uh, you can add that. And now you can see only the ones that were created by an algorithm. Uh, in this case, oh, because I was in the wrong folder. Um, it doesn't show any, but you could filter down to just those algorithm created ones, and then you could select them all and delete them if you wanted to. But rather than delete them, if you just wanted to exclude them, you could go the other way, right? So if you wanted to go into filters and just look at ones that were human created, right, you could add that, um, or ones that were maybe algorithm created, but human modified to be correct, you can then add those, right? And then for your observation purposes, you can essentially then see only those types. Uh, your pardon. All right, and so then you can, for exporting purposes, then go through and then QA, QC only those types uh, and then export essentially. So if you, if you then select it all, you could export either the selected or the filtered view based on all of those things. So you can, you can then have them, but exclude them from any type of analysis you want to do, or you could batch delete them if you wanted to. So what we're really trying to do is give you options aside from just only there or only not there, depending upon what you're trying to do. Great. And before we get to the hands raised, um, just another question from the chat. Are there other algorithms available than the ones you presented? Can we use our own algorithm through the portal, upload, um, uh, and upload? Feels algorithm? like a planted question, but I'm going to go <laughs> with it anyways. <laughs> I was about to say it's well uh, well at, so I'll let you go through that. Uh, currently, right now, uh, from ones that you can select, we only have the Fathomnet Meg Detector and the vulnerable marine ecosystems one. But 
one of the things about the portal in general is that it's not just a kind of web-based self-service tool, but it's backed by both kind of a DevOps staff who's there to help you if you have issues or require assistance for setting up both your project, ingesting media, ingesting large amounts of media, um, as well as a dedicated MLOps staff. So you saw uh, Laura in the slides earlier. So she is here currently uh, to help you if you have, say want to upload a bunch of data market and fine tune an algorithm for your specific purposes. Um, though that algorithm can then be re-uploaded into the platform via either submission or because she knows the DevOps steps, we can just re register it within the platform itself and become available. If you have uh, an existing model that you would like to use, um, you can submit it right here. Currently, we just kind of say YOLO v5, YOLO v8 um, in terms of like, you can just submit a weights file and that'll be easy for us to just figure out the labels, figure out the weights, and then it becomes almost self-registered. If you have another uh, algorithm type, then essentially you'll have to get in touch with us We'll have to look at the inferencing code and then we'll have to do a bunch of stuff to kind of wrap it within the uh, ability to inference within the platform. But yes, the goal is for you to be able to bring models you, you have, train models on your data. Currently, that is via the MLOP staff only. But our year one post-launch goal is to move more and more of that into kind of a self-service model. So, so right now, a lot of it is around marking data for export that you could then work with your data science team or our data mm -hmm. science team for training models. But in the future, there will be a kind of a, hey, can you please fine tune the megalodon detector using my subset of labels so that I can then run this model on my specific data, right? Those are the types of workflows that we're really, really trying to um, moving towards to make this uh, kind of the AI assisted the annotation and analysis a lot more useful for a lot more people.